One of the plaintiffs in a case against Illinois' gun and magazine ban, Dane Harrell, he is part of the Harrell v. Raul, but that's just one of three, uh, well, one of four cases uh, that is in the Southern District of Illinois Federal Court that was heard Wednesday. Uh, and I uh, ran into Dale uh, at the at Dane rather at the uh, uh, courthouse down in East St. Louis. Uh, it was good to see him again after not having seen him for probably five years or so. Uh, so Dane, thank you for taking time with us this morning on WMAY to talk about your involvement in this case. Uh, so let's get right on into it. H- how did you get involved in this case? Good morning, Greg. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on. I was uh, I've been an activist, I guess, not by design or by choice, but been a little bit active in the Second Amendment's uh, issue. I'm kind of a policy nerd. And when they were casting the net, uh, asking if there were folks that were interested in being or would be willing to be a name litigant uh, for the case, in January, I, I threw my name in the hat and I was contacted rather quickly by, by some of the organizers for the legal side. And it took me about 30 seconds to, to agree to be included in the legal action. So this is a part of the National Shooting Sports Foundation, or the uh, which uh, which uh, gun group uh, is is your case part of again? This is the ISRA uh, Firearms Policy Coalition and SAF Action, gotcha. along with two along with two Illinois gun shops. And uh, there's uh, three other cases out there from the National Shooting Sports Foundation and another one from the Federal License uh, Firearms uh, of Illinois. Uh, you've also got uh, a fourth case from uh, Crawford County uh, with a plaintiff named Langley that Thomas Mag, the attorney, is leading in that one. So, again, four cases, federal court. Wednesday was the hearing. What was your takeaway from the hearing? I thought it was an excellent civics lesson. The, the tone that uh, Judge McGlynn set from the start, I thought, was very uh, very thoughtful, very measured. It was interesting when he asked folks to take a look at the two drawings that he put up on the screen, and people formed opinions based on what they saw in the same drawing. Yeah, it was like a, a bunny or a duck, uh, a, a young woman or an old woman. Uh, people see things differently. Exactly. And, and I thought that was a good tone to set uh, for the discussion. And, of course, he emphasized civility. And I thought there was a lot of that in the courtroom. Obviously, it's a it's a formal environment, but I was I was impressed by the by the proceedings, and I thought it was very interesting. How do you feel um, after you know the the various questions that the judge asked the plaintiffs, the questions the judge asked the state as defendants, and uh, ultimately saying at the at the end, uh, you know, hey, uh, from where he sits, he looks at the gun, not necessarily uh, he looks at the victims and the and the perpetrators, not necessarily the gun, and he wants to know what uh, is causing young people to commit such acts of violence, what medicines they may be on, what other red flags there may be. Um, your takeaway of how you feel this case is going to go considering the questions the judge asked and the statements he made? I think following the Supreme Court Bruin decision last summer, and there was a comment made by by the by the plaintiff's uh, attorney that the state effectively ignored the Bruin decision and they focused on on previous uh, Supreme Court rulings. I thought that was rather uh, rather telling. The, the the state's focus seemed to be on self defense use of uh, particular firearms. In this case, uh, AR-15s, specifically AR-15, AR-15s were talked about almost exclusively, uh, which I which I think is 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 uh, an in- interesting aspect of the case. But the fact that the case the state was focused on self defense use self defense use of a firearm, uh, specifically or at least implying a, a discharge of a firearm. That, that that doesn't capture what Bruin said, and Bruin said that uh, firearms in common use for lawful purposes, such as such as self-defense, which to me includes things like informal shooting, hunting, collecting, um, you know, plinking with one's family. It it the state seemed to be hanging their hat on self-defense use, and even then there are nuances to that. It doesn't mean that someone has to actually employ a firearm to have a deterrent effect on on people wishing to do them harm. The, the mere fact that they may be possessed could have a, a, a self-defense deterrent effect uh, on, on the criminal element. So that, that was one of the observations. And, and, I, and I agree with what you said about looking at what are, what are the motivations behind people that want to go in and, and kill their former classmates or, or kill people in a church. And, and that doesn't seem to be discussed uh, from a policymaking perspective with any kind of rigor. 
And I think it's intellectually lazy to immediately uh, focus on the tool that's used uh, in, these, in these terrible killings. And we have to find a way to address them. But I think to, to automatically go to def- the default position that the tool is important or the most important aspect is um, – is doing a disservice to the policymaking process. We're talking with Dane Harrell. He is uh, one of the plaintiffs in uh, one of four cases challenging Illinois' gun and magazine ban in federal court after Wednesday's hearing in the Southern District down in East St. Louis. Uh, and uh, we'll see what ultimately happens there. Uh, and and just your thoughts on, uh, you know, this could go uh, by the way of the plaintiffs with the judge issuing a preliminary injunction. Uh, the state could uh, appeal that to the uh uh, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. It could go all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, for all we know. Um, but uh, you know, w- w- which way are you seeing this going? Do you think that the the, the law is going to be halted here on this level uh, before it gets to the appellate court? I, I don't know, Greg, and I and I'm not sure how sweeping any kind of injunction would be. I know at the state level, some of the some of the uh, decisions made by the state judges have affected uh, named or listed individuals only. So I. I'm not an attorney, and I, and I can't really speculate on what the effect may be, but I think everybody's in agreement, regardless of which side of the issue they're on, that, that this is probably going to be a long, protracted uh, legal battle, and it'll, it'll, it'll probably end up in the courts. It's already been months. It'll probably end up in the courts for, for many more months, if not years. Monday, we had uh, one of the provisions of the ban on semi-automatic weapons and magazines kick in, uh, essentially allowing for penalties to be issued, petty offense, $1,000 fine for certain magazines that are not compliant if you're found with them. Uh, also, possibly up to a Class three felony, depending on how many instances of having certain um, uh, firearms that aren't compliant with the law. Uh, but another deadline coming up is October 1st, January 1st, for the gun registration. Uh, Dane, uh, how important is it that this gets rectified before that uh, that that window opens? I, realistically, Greg, I don't think it will be resolved uh, between now and October. Who knows how the how the the legal uh, maneuvering is going to bounce back and forth between the two opposing sides? And and based on what we've seen in other states uh, that have had similar schemes for registration and taxation on what up to this point have been legally owned items. I, I, I don't even want to speculate what the compliance rate is going to be, and and that's going to be up to each, each individual to decide. But they say good policy is one where people follow um, um, pretty universally. But if if we look at New York and the non-compliance rate, um, or, or one of the other states for a registration scheme, I think they estimated the non-compliance rate was in the 90 percentile. I'm not sure that's good policy if folks uh, that are otherwise law-abiding are going to be non-compliant. Dane, uh, one question we always hear uh, is how do we address gun violence? How do we address gang violence? There seems to be a uh, a, a growing uh, number of mass shootings, at least high profile mass shootings. Uh, So, uh, you know, some are asking, well, what are the gun rights advocates uh, answers to 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 addressing that type of violence? I think we have to look at the fragmentation of society where. We're, we're pitted against each other in, in, in so many different ways, whether it's based on the color of our skin or our politics. And, and, and these issues cross, cross those demographic lines and those political lines. There are many, many, many tens of thousands, if not millions, of uh, gun owners on, of, of all colors and all political stripes. But what are the things that are motivating young people to, or in most cases, young people to go in and, and, and kill their friends? And, and we never hear anything about the toxicology reports. We're still waiting from the Nashville killing. Uh, the the young woman that went and killed the, the children in the school, we're still waiting to hear what may have motivated her based on her writings. And, and I don't believe there's any reason why we can't read those, even while the state and federal investigators continue to analyze them. Uh, it's, it, they're, if they're written documents, we ought to have some insight into what motivates people. And I think, again, the prevalence of prescription drugs is is a is a a factor, certainly one we ought to look at, but it's a matter of taking all the things that, that may uh, motivate somebody and not just focusing on the tool. The, the bath killing at the school in Michigan, largest largest number of students killed in a single incident in history it was in 1927, and the individual planted a bomb in a school, uh, or over the period of several days planted a bomb, and he killed what, I think it was close to 
close to 40 or 50 students. That was in 1927. So if people are intent on killing others, they'll find a way to do so, whether it's driving their car into a crowded school bus stop, or I think we saw in in Sweden uh, a couple years ago where they've banned many of the firearms that are protected here in this country under the Second Amendment. Somebody went into a supermarket and killed people using a bow and arrow. So if people are intent on doing evil, and it, it is evil what they do, um, then they're going to find the means to do that. And I think focusing on the firearms, particularly considering how common they are in American society, is, uh, is, is not time well spent. Dane Harrell, uh, one of the plaintiffs in uh, one of four challenges against Illinois' gun and magazine ban in federal court. We'll be watching closely to see what the judge decides in that case. And, Dane, we'll definitely be talking again in the near future, okay? Thank you, Greg. Have a very good weekend and be safe. You too. It is Springfield's Morning News on 92.7 WMAY, Springfield's News.